Hello there, physics students. I thought I would attempt to talk about the E field for a coaxial cable so that I can talk about potential difference of a coaxial cable. So we talk about capacitance. So I'm also going to explain what this thing is and why we care. Besides the fact that it's something that uh, you need to know for the course, these are really commonly used. We're going to start with E field. The E field calculation that we're going to use here is going to come from Gauss's law. And if we use the Gauss's law definition, that would mean that the flux through our closed surface is going to be the integral, again, over that closed surface of E dot dA. And as we've usually done here, we're going to attempt to make a Gaussian surface that uh, will simplify the calculation. And I, I borrowed a picture from the hyperphysics website here. You can see what will be the inside of our coax cable. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. I have a, a better picture. But I want to talk about the Gaussian surface we're going to draw and why the uh, ends of this thing aren't going to matter for the area. You can see actually from the diagram here that the area vector, which is going to be perpendicular to that circle on the end, is at a right angle to the E-field right there. So if this is a positively charged conductor, the E-field is going to be going uh, vertically upward. And the, at the end of this Gaussian surface, the area vector is at a, uh, running along the x-axis. So those two are at a 90 degree angle, and since we're using the dot product, the area of the circles on the circles on the end, circles on the end on the end of so when using a Gaussian surface to find the E field for a long conducting object, then you only need the surface area of the cylinder itself, not the uh, the circle. So only the uh, the height of the thing, not the, the area on the ends. Well, that's awesome because it turns out that when you use Gauss's law. All you need to know is the Q that's enclosed, so we're going to say that there's a charge Q on that wire divided by the permittivity of free, sp free space epsilon naught, which means that the E field times the area of that cylinder without the ends, which is just the area is 2 times pi times the radius, which is R in this case, or some distance R away from the middle of that wire, uh, times the length of the cylinder, and that's going to be equal, Q, equal to Q over epsilon naught. So that actually is nearly the, so we saved ourselves from any complicated calculus by acknowledging the fact that the E field uh, will simply be the closed integral of the area, which is just a surface area. That's how we've used Gauss's law almost every time we've applied it. So E times area is Q over epsilon naught. I would also like to add in a couple of constants here, or uh, things that we often use when we talk about um, potential and E-field and capacitance and charge, and that's the definition of linear charge density. So lambda here is Q over L. I throw that in there because I can rewrite our, I can rearrange this expression over here to be E equals 1 over 2 pi epsilon naught. You'll notice this is almost K, the Coulomb's constant that we've used before. So if we take that guy and double it, that's all that is. Let's clean that up slightly, because I'm a perfectionist. I'm really, really not. Anyway, if I take this area and divide both and divide it over into the Q over epsilon naught side, I'm going to get one over two pi epsilon naught, and then I'm going to have Q over L, which is just going to be lambda here in a minute, and one over R. So the R came over here. The Q over uh, L is this quantity, and the two pi epsilon naught is right there. So I can that means I can simplify this slightly to two times k times lambda over r. So the E field using Gauss's law here for a long uh, conducting wire is two times k times lambda over r, and that expression is going to be very helpful when trying to figure out the potential difference and ultimately what we'd like to do is figure out how this thing could act as a capacitor so let's take a look at the next step so now we're going to add again i borrowed this picture from hyperphysics and again lambda is going to be the charge per unit length so what we're going to do now is attempt to take the definition of, of uh, potential difference we've used before and come up with an expression that will eventually lead us to capacitance so let's talk about potential difference the potential difference V, which is also the, the potential at B minus potential at A due to this 
charge system we're talking about here. By the way, you'll notice the way the uh, area, the uh, radii work. From the middle of the inner conductor to its outer edge is radius A, and from the middle of the conductor out to the inner edge of that conductor is radius B. So between A and B, there's going to be something. We're going to call that a dielectric later, but it could just as easily be air, or it could be uh, plastic. It could be, as a matter of fact, you'll see uh, um, when you look at a, a coax cable like you have plugged into your television, this is probably plastic. So potential difference is defined to be the negative integral from position A to position B of E dot ds, which, by the way, the dot product here will mean that we're only going to be dealing with the radial components. So honestly, we could rewrite this as delta v is negative integral from a to b v dr. So now the vector nature goes away, reminding you, by the way, that the uh, potential difference is not a vector quantity. So that was negative integral. It was really bad. I'm trying to clean it up slightly. OK, well, let's take this a couple of steps further and simplify it some. Let's actually do the integral. So that's terrible again. So the potential difference then is going to be the negative integral from A to B of E dr. But we have E. So that's negative 2k lambda. And I'm going to leave the 1 over r in there. And then we've got dr over r from a to b. So what I've done there is I've replaced our expression, uh, just e. I've replaced e with 2k lambda over r. But the 2k lambda is going to be a constant, meaning that with my integral, as we've done with a lot of this electricity and magnetism stuff, our goal was to put this in a form we could integrate. So we needed to relate. Uh, E field to R, and we actually had most of that expression done from before, so now all we have to do is integrate this, and we'll have the potential difference between A and B. So that's not that difficult of an integral to do, luckily for us. So potential difference is then negative 2 times K times lambda, and then natural log of R from A to B. And if you Remember when we use the limit notation, that's natural log of b minus natural log of a. So this expression really becomes negative 2 times k times lambda times natural log of b over a. When you subtract two natural logs, it's the same as dividing those, those values. So that is nearly what I wanted to end with. So that's potential difference right there. And I want to remind you that capacitance, I want to talk about the capacitance of a, of a conductor like this, a um, coax cable. I may have forgotten the name. So, so capacitance is defined to be the absolute value of the charge divided by the absolute value of the potential difference. So when you have the two conductors like we have in this picture here, calling the inside positive and the outside negative to help us explain how this is going to work. If you want to talk about how the capacitance can be used in uh, a way to cause electricity to be stored or to send a signal down the line, or if you want to make a capacitor out of a system like this, then what you need to know is the charge. And the, the reason that the sign won't, won't matter is as long once we charge this thing up, its capacitance is going to be determined by the geometry of the scenario. And the generally, it's only the geometry of the scenario. So the uh, charge here is going to be from the, if we were to draw a Gaussian surface on the hole on the outside of this thing, it would be zero anyway. So if we were to include the, include the entire thing in there, it's, it's electrically neutral, which is true for all the capacitor scenarios we've talked about here. So the charge, the sign on the charge doesn't matter, because if the inside is negative, the outside is positive with the same charge. If the inside is positive, then the outside is negative with the same charge, as long as it's uh, holding as much as long as this thing has reached the potential difference of the circuit uh, in question. And that's also true of the potential difference. So even though the terminals, there will be a negative and positive polarity when you make a circuit out of the thing for a given capacitor, char the absolute value of the charge is how you figure out the capacitance of the thing divided by the absolute uh, value of the potential difference between your two components. 
So that means the capacitance for a coax cab cable is going to be Q over delta V. And we're going to drop the uh, absolute value bars, remembering that that's the definition. <clears throat> so then we get Q divided by 2 times K, and it was lambda, which is Q over L, times natural log of B over A. So the charge ends up dropping out of this expression, which is what we should expect for a capacitor. We should see that the capacitor is dependent on the geometry of our scenario and not about the, the charge on the thing. So for a coax cable, the capacitance is going to be, and this L is going to move to the top, so L over 2 times K times natural log of B over A. So notice that there are two different components, so that's our capacitance. That's what I really wanted to get to. There are two different components here that determine the capacitance of a cable like this. That's the length and the distance between the two conductors. And de depending on how you build your circuit or build your cable, you can actually change quite a lot of the properties of this thing. I wanted to end by showing a kind of a close-up view of what most people have in their home. If you have cable television uh, or have seen you know, it before, and I'm sure you probably have, this is what a coax cable looks like. The center piece is what we were calling the radius A. It's a copper conductor in this case. Then there's a plastic stuff that you can see there that actually uh, separates the two materials. This is the dielectric of our capacitor. And then this entire con uh, connector here, which is actually connected to the inside of the cable, you can see the black coating there. This, this outer piece is that outer connector, the outer conductor. So uh, what the way cable television works is it'll send a load electrical signal down this cable and it ends up making a, a, a circuit because the outside of this thing and the inside of this thing will be connected to some system that can send and receive electrical signals. So that's one very common use. We use these kind of cables actually all over. The, in fact, most of the time when people are using cables, some aspect of this capacitance is actually involved in how the thing was designed. So, you know, it's the kind of thing you need to know if you're going to design cables pretty much at all. All right, so that's how that works.